starting here with the 49ers, and I project them very similarly to how they've been under Kyle Shanahan, a near 50-50 split in most of his years, a little bit below average in league total plays, but I actually have them going above that because a lot of the reports so far are they expect the Niners offense to be more aggressive this year, largely based on the fact that Christian McCaffrey will now have a full offseason, says the beat writers, that they have a ton of faith in Brock Purdy after what he did as a rookie, and they think he can take another step forward and really engineer more no huddle type of situations. And then they also mentioned losing Robbie Gould could put this team in more situations. They have to go for it on fourth down. So keeping more plays there for the offense as well. So I did bump them up. I kept that kind of 50, 50 split going, but with a, a few more plays than what we've typically seen in a Kyle Shanahan offense is where I bumped that up. And that obviously, as I said at the top, has a lot to do with Brock Purdy. And I know entering the offseason, there's a lot of question marks. Is Trey Lance got to come on and in after they gave up all this investment to go get him and all the dynamic traits he brings? And certainly there's, there is the argument that this offense could be even more dangerous with Trey Lance, but then there's also that high floor, that stability with Brock Purdy after he came in, led this team. They already were a great team, but he continued to plow forward. And who knows what would have happened against the Eagles there in the playoffs. I still think the Eagles probably take that game, but ultimately – Purdy would have made it more competitive. There's no doubt about that. So I think this whole offense definitely continues another step forward after what we saw in Purdy. We'll talk about how he helped every single ship here rise. Other than Ayuk, he stayed about similar to what he did. Uh, but every other player benefited greatly from the stability that Brock Purdy brought. He had multiple touchdowns in all but one game that he played. So I really, really like Brock Purdy. And as you can see, I have him projected pretty well here, even in a lower volume passing attack, you know, bottom half in the league in pass attempts. I think he'll be very, very efficient. 4,281 yards, 32 touchdowns, near 70% completion rate, which is what we saw last year. He protected the ball very well. So 11 ins might even be high for this kid. There is the risk that, you know, that they've, NFL people now have tape on him and he's not that special and suddenly he's going to get figured out. But ultimately, the thing that he's lauded for is his high IQ, his quick decision making, his ability to read the defenses and find the right mismatch. And Kyle Shanahan knows how to do that better than anyone. He just needs the guy to deliver the rock and make the reads the right way. He doesn't need a dynamic guy like Trey Lance to have this offense just be a machine down the field. So I don't think that uh, you'd have to figure out Kyle Shanahan and Brock Purdy, in my opinion, to get this offense stalled out. So I think that's a, a nice, a good sized aerial pie for not a ton of pass attempts. I think they're going to be very, very efficient as we've seen historically with Kyle Shanahan, but even a level further here uh, as a lot of the beat writers are projecting as well, based on the early camp practices. Now, how will it all shake out that 4,200? I, I guess we'll start with the ground game. There's a little guy named Christian McCaffrey here that might be of interest to you guys and fantasy owners. I do think he definitely deserves to be the starter. I, I just want to make sure, too, like I, I, this isn't me saying Brock Purdy is going to be the starter, and I think he's the best. Every single person down to Adam Schefter has said he's the unanimous guy at this point, and that, that Trey Lance, Sam Darnold, they're battling it out for two, but they think that Purdy is the now and the future of this team. So I, I really do feel pretty good about him being the guy assuming he's healthy and, and doesn't just completely fall on his face. But let's move to the run game at this point for that little guy named CMC. Uh, actually, you know what? I, I'd rather save him till the end. He's the, he's the cherry on top to this entire offense. And what he did once he got here was absolutely phenomenal. Back to his 2018 cheat code style season. We could see that again. But how do I expect that, you know, 4,300 or so and 30 touchdowns of Brock Purdy to be distributed? Well, they have some really big mouths to feed. But I think it's going to be very concentrated to those four top five mouths. And that's Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, and Christian McCaffrey. I have all of them right around 100 targets, which obviously all of them deserve that. They're all phenomenal talents, and they all uh, can do so many different things with the ball, be so efficient. And so I actually have Ayuk leading the way here in terms of total targets. He was the wide receiver one last year. Some of that was because of Debo Samuel. He missed some time. He just didn't look like Debo Samuel for a good chunk of last year. But a lot of that is just Ayuk continued to take that next step last year. And all the reports so far in camp, you know, all these beat writers and ESPN, they were given their, their surprise standout in every camp. 
And the guy wrote you, Brandon Ayuk's my surprise standout. And that's not a bold thing, given that he led the team in receiving last year. But the standout piece of it was he has taken his game to such a different level this year. And again, he's already been phenomenal, but he's been taking his game to such a different level. I think everyone's going to be shocked at how much better this guy is. And that's a scary thought, given how good he has already been so far in his NFL career. I mean, Debo Samuel himself saying, you couldn't cover this guy in a phone booth with how he's moving out there. He was apparently the MVP of almost every single day going deep after the catch, everything. He's in the contract year as well. So it seems like he really entered camp ready to go, ready to feast. So I love Brandon Ayuk. I think he's going to lead this team in targets, but the production will still be pretty spread out. Uh, you know, 120 to him, 114 to Debo. There are, there's a lot of mouths and they're all going to be fed well, but I see him getting 80 catches on his 120 targets for right around 1,100 yards and eight TDs with, again, that the, all those reports are coming true. Maybe there's a ceiling for even more here. There is that idea that this offense could just blow up like we saw with Kyle Shanahan leading that Falcons attack uh, back in you know when they, they lost to the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Had to toss that in there. But they, we've seen offenses truly just explode under him, and maybe this is the piece. I don't know if Purdy can really engineer that level of an explosive offense, but you look at all these pieces. I mean, you got Debo Samuel, who – there's a lot of reason to expect a big bounce back from this guy. I have him getting 114 targets, uh, and, and maybe he does end up leading the way ahead of Brandon Ayuk. There's some interesting trends on Debo where even with his down year last year, he still has uh, – he's in the top five in terms of top ten finishes over his last two years – over almost 40% of his games have been in the top 10. Over half of those games have been a wide receiver one top 12. And he was apparently disgusted with his film training much, much harder. He said, you know, the contract distractions got the best of him. He admitted that it wasn't his best off season that he's gotten back to doing everything he did uh, in the 2021 off season before he had that monster season was the wide receiver three in fantasy averaging over 21 points per game. Uh, he was an absolute monster that season. And he says he's destined. He really wants to make sure he gets back there. There's a weird trend with Debo. This doesn't really factor into my projections at all, but it is of just interesting note in odd years. So 2019 and 2021, he played all you know 31 games. That was certainly his healthiest two seasons. He had 134 catches, 2,200 yards, nine touchdowns, in addition to 11 rushing touchdowns on the ground as well. So 20 total touchdowns in those two seasons. And then you look at his even number season so far in his career, his passing receptions uh, and, and cut, nearly cut in half, only 1,000 yards compared to 2,200 yards and just three rushing touchdowns compared to 11. So for whatever reason, he has really spiked his production in odd years. I, I don't know why, but we're in an odd year. So, hey, if that trend continues and it sounds like he, he's just like, yep, I'm getting back to my odd year phases. He recognizes it. He's been grinding. Uh, he really, really wants to get it done. He's sickened by what he did last year. So I'm ready to buy back into there. A lot of people saying Debo, oh, no, he's not going to see the rushing work now that McCaffrey's there. Why? Well, I, I project him to be right in line. He's seen 11% and 13% rushing market share in back-to-back years and with McCaffrey there he actually saw an increase in carries per game compared to the games before McCaffrey arrived he was at 3.4 carries per game with McCaffrey on the team the year before that was 3.6 where he had that blow up you know eight touchdowns on the ground so I think you know 54 yards uh, 54 rushes rather for right around he's been at 6.2 5.8 yards per carry so I think he can rip another 300 plus on the ground he's a great touchdown score when they get in close on some of those crazy designed plays so I really think that's reasonable in addition to some quality uh, receiving totals right around 1200 total yards right around 10 total touchdowns with touches coming from every facet of the game I think Debo does have a nice rebound making him a great late third, early fourth target in your drafts. But Ayuk, as I mentioned, right around there in production, and I think you, you get him around two or three later. The Debo, I like them both. I like stacking them up. I think it's great. But the one guy that benefited the most from having Brock Purdy was George Kittle, I, both from a target share perspective, from an overall productive productivity standpoint. George Kittle really ate as soon as Brock Purdy went into the lineup. He leaned on his big tight end. In fact, he scored... George Kittle, seven touchdowns in his five regular season games with Brock Purdy. And it wasn't just like one four touchdown monster. It was spread out. You know, looking at the game logs right now, two touchdowns, two touchdowns, one touchdown, two touchdowns. The only game he didn't score was Purdy's first start in which they were just 
bending over the Buccaneers led by Tom Brady. Uh, they were on 35 to seven. They took the air out of the ball. He didn't need to keep throwing. So we didn't see much from Kittle that game, but every single other game, he was an absolute monster. 80% of his games with Brock Purdy was a tight end one. He also had a, a five catch, a hundred yard day in the playoffs against the Cowboys as well. So this is definitely somebody that can be leaned upon as a, he, he bumped up as soon as I did this research and saw just how much better he was with Brock Purdy, 18.6 points per game with Purdy versus 10.9 without him. I mean, eight, eight points more. That's a huge spike with Brock Purdy. And as soon as I saw just how good he was with him, I bumped him right back up to tight end four uh, with the, the ability to chase those big three uh, Andrews Hawkinson and of course, Kelsey at the top, you won't catch, but th this guy really, really lit it up with Brock Purdy. So all these ships did rise with Brock Purdy. Other than, you know, as I said, Ayuk did stay relatively the same, 13.5 versus 13.7 without Purdy. So he was good no matter who was throwing him the rock. He did average more catches and more yards per game, though. So if the touchdowns follow with Purdy, and if he is truly taking that next step, like people say, which I, I can't even imagine what that would look like given how good he's already been. I'm just so excited for every single one of these pass catchers. But as mentioned at the top, we got to save the the main course here. And that's crazy that like all three of those guys are just like side dishes to Christian McCaffrey, uh, an absolute monster that as soon as he got over with the 49ers, with or without Brock Purdy, became an absolute beast, averaging over 23 fantasy points per game. That was by far the most in the league. All but one of his games was an RB1 after he arrived. Huge spikes in receiving usage, huge spikes in touchdowns, spikes in yards per carry as a great, he's a great runner in any type of scheme, but especially the Shanahan scheme that makes it just easy for the running backs. He was a beast. He was an absolute monster, Christian McCaffrey. And then he was even better when Brock Purdy took over. In fact, he scored at least one touchdown, whether receiving or rushing, in every single game, including playoffs, that Brock Purdy played. He had nine. Nine total touchdowns in those eight games as well. So on pace for over 18 touchdowns on the year while playing with Brock Purdy, an absolute monster. And after he arrived, uh, um, arrived there with San Fran, the receiving role, we always knew he could catch the ball, but it took yet another level, 107 targets on pace for it uh, and on pace for as well as 85 catches, you know, nearly 800 yards and seven just receiving touchdowns, never mind the rushing work where he was on pace for 1,200 rushing yards, 10 rushing touchdowns as well. Back to that, again, 2018 type of cheat code McCaffrey. And to me, the only thing in his way from achieving that yet again would be health. We know that there's been some injury concerns in the past with him, but he stayed relatively healthy all last year. And in an offense that he doesn't have to take huge hits or take 350 carries to be productive, you know, I, I have him going for the lion's share of the work here. Let me kind of scroll back up. I realize I just didn't even have uh, McCaffrey pulled up here. I have him still getting, you know, 53% of the carries. So that equates to 286 in this healthy ground pie, 98 targets. That will definitely be towards the top for running backs in terms of opportunities. But in an efficient offense like this, he can do in an, an efficient player like him that much more work. So, you know, nearly, I, I have him going for almost 2K total yards, nearly nine, uh, you know, 18 touchdowns, and none of it really feels that unreasonable to me, as well as 83 catches through the air. So that's why I think McCaffrey has to be your number one pick overall. It may be in best ball when the receivers go so heavily. Yes, I do think Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase are strong cases at tops of drafts too, but after statting this out and just seeing how much healthy pie there is for him to eat in both facets of the game, I might start taking him one overall. He's just that damn good. And this offense is that damn good behind him. You know, a little bit just scraps, but they do typically have a running back. See 25 to 30% their RB two, And Eli Mitchell's a good back. So I have him mixing in for some, some work, some touchdowns being okay. He's more of a handcuff though. And then it, the receiving wise, I have nobody else of note, just Danny Gray, Juwan Jennings, whatever they end up picking up. So they pick up, but really those big four and I love them all their price tags. That being CMC potentially first overall Debo, a great late third, early fourth. Ayuk, amazing target in the fifth and sixth, and Kittle right there in the, the fourth and fifth, a great tight end edge given again, that all these ships rise with Brock Purdy. If Trey Lance does take over, Things will look different, and I'll have to really readjust these projections, but it does seem like it's definitely the Brock Purdy show, and I'm just so excited to see what year two brings. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm just going to kind of repeat a couple of things that you said. We had similar takes. This obviously it's not a hot take. It all hinges on Brock Purdy, right? I mean, we saw him in a, a 
small, but not super small sample size last year. And we saw him be successful for like what, like half the season, something like that. I mean, that's not nothing to sneeze yeah, at. About eight games, uh, like, including playoffs, he played, I think, seven full games. And then you had the elbow injury. And that, yeah, so so it's a decent like sample, sample size. size. And, and he was excellent. And yeah, I mean, there's some question marks. Is he going to be that excellent anymore? If he is, then yeah, these guys could all have substantial like big years obviously health comes into play with all these guys the only one of these guys that i don't like at their price tag is debo um and i love debo he's my you know when he was awesome and maybe he's still awesome he's just about the most fun guy to watch that there is uh but I, i'm not i agree with you i think his numbers will be comparable to iuk's and if you can get iuk two rounds cheaper i'm not really looking to have them both so much more likely to take Ayuk than Debo. I agree. Kittle's value greatly increases with Purdy. And I would probably also have him four overall as tight ends. And maybe, I don't know, there's like a small, small part of me that would maybe even like him as much as Hawkinson, but that might be crazy. Yeah, the touchdown upside is higher with with Kittle. If he does see the 109 targets he was on pace for with Purdy, if that maintains, he definitely could eat outscore every tight end not named Kelsey, you know, that, right. that we've seen it before. It gets, we're talking about one of the best tight ends that ever played the game. So, yeah, I, I'm with you there. He could definitely threaten Hawkinson. Uh, they're neck and neck. They're back in a tier together for me, whereas before yeah. I had them a little bit separated. So, yeah, I'm I'm all in. I love this 49ers team. I love them at their price tags. Um, I, and and like, in all these big stats I'm projecting, again, it's not like 4,200 yards and 32 touchdowns for Purdy. That's not – insane especially when you're throwing to these weapons that's why it doesn't like they seem like big numbers and a lot of these guys are going to be toward the tops of their positions but we're not asking purdy to be otherworldly it's not like a david daniel jones projection i had the other series 32 touchdowns could end up being a lot but remember he threw two in every single game last year he was on pace for 34 so yeah i mean he just has to be serviceable and he'll have good numbers because the scheme's so good and everyone else around him will continue to rise as they did last year too I really do think Trey Lance is garbage, though. I got to say. I've, yeah, I've been on that. I don't, I don't think he deserves it. Here. I was so happy to trade him in our Dynasty League. Obviously, the raw ceiling remains as high as anybody, but yeah, I'm, I'm with yeah. you. I don't think he's going to turn into be anything. And it, what, imagine they had just not given up all those picks for him and they just went with, you know, they obviously didn't know what they had in Brock Purdy when they got him, but they, they still had all the draft capital. Plus, you know, just the starter they had, this team could be that much scarier. They sunk like three first rounders into Trey Lance. I mean, my God. I thought that was crazy at the time. Every, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm probably wrong about as many of these things as I'm right, but I was right about that one. What is up, you fantasy wolf? Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, share your thoughts in the comments, check out some more videos, and join the newest Wolfpack by subscribing below. Ooh.